Welcome back to Benny's Custom Works, proudly supported by Spares Box. Today we're back on Gian's 180 again. Uh, a few simple tasks today. We're going to do a full coolant flush and we're going to explain how to do it properly on an SR. Someone will probably correct me in the comments, let me know if I do it wrong. And the other thing we're going to do is change the brake discs front and rear and we're also going to do rear pads. So obviously previously you guys have seen us do the front pads on it, but the discs aren't great and obviously the rear discs and pads need, need some attention as well. Uh, we're also going to show you how to adjust the handbrake on the back because this actually has Skyline style rear brakes on it. So it's got a drum within the, within the disc. But should be plenty of uh, little, little tips and tricks as we go today. So let's get stuck in. Yes. I love when we get the cardboard. That's my favorite. Rear pads. Nissan Subaru, that's a good sign. Disc brake front, yay. So far so good on my ordering of parts. Ooh, stickers. The moment of truth. Great success. One out of two ain't bad. Just these old cook things can go in the scrap pile. So your car has aftermarket five stud hubs on it. So they're four and five stud. I thought it, I always thought it had Silvia like S15 hubs in it. We both thought wrong. So I think these used to be like a just jap conversion that you could buy where they actually just made a hub that had the studs screw in. So they, rather than be a press in stud from the back, the hubs threaded with four and five stud pattern on it. I don't know what the benefit is to having both patterns, but I guess it's convenient if you've got two sets of wheels or whatever. I guess the other thing is to, to have this kind of custom hub as opposed to putting the S1415 stuff on is you don't have to change your coilovers because it still runs an S13 type knuckle. I guess it works. Hopefully we never have to change the wheel bearings because I don't know how that's going to work. These are our new DBA T3 4000 series discs. So these are a, a motorsport street style disc um, I probably wouldn't go doing crazy track days on this still this disc still uh, it is still more focused to street use than motorsport use um, you get away with doing track days on it but there are more specific discs for track days obviously this primarily is a street car so these will be really good for it the cool thing about these discs are they give you uh, these these three lines are actually heat indicating paint so basically when you get to a certain temperature, uh, the, the green one at about 450 degrees goes white, the orange at 550 degrees goes yellow, and the red at 630 degrees goes white. That basically gives you a good heat indication of how hot these discs have been. Um, I wouldn't go heating these things to death because they will warp, they will crack. But the same with any street rotor, it's not a, it's not a fault or a problem with the product. It's just down to an application thing. So. These are really good street focused performance disc, which is exactly what this car's uh, purpose is. But there's definitely other products out there like the DBA 5000 series and other, other aftermarket brands that are more focused on true motorsport applications. But this is gonna meet our needs exactly today. So this is what we're using. We've also got the same discs for the rear and we've got some uh, DBA performance pads to go on the rear to complement the Project Mew pads we've already fitted. So let's throw these suckers on. When you're fitting new discs to existing hubs, it's a really good idea to try and clean this face up as best you can. These ones aren't too bad, so I'm just going to give them a quick buff with a scotch pad. Uh, for really bad, rusty, heavy flaked ones, you probably want to use a gasket buffing type pad. Um, unfortunately, you really need to take the studs out to do it properly. Um, if, you, if you literally just whiz between the studs, you actually end up with high points on the back of the stud and around the studs, so you can actually make things worse rather than better. So. For that reason, I've gone for the little scotchy pad because you can get the whole way around everything. But like I said, if it's really heavily corroded or, or flaking rust, I'd recommend to remove the studs and give it a proper clean up because you can have height differences by only buffing between the studs. I've seen heaps of people do it that way and potentially you can be introducing problems that you would actually avoid by just putting it on dirty. But the instructions say to clean the hub, so we're going to try and do that today, and that's how we normally do it anyway. So, give it a good, uh, yeah, scrub with a buffing pad and some brake cleaner. 
literally just taken two seconds to hit that and it's it's already brought a good shine back to it so um yeah nice and simple and hopefully it avoids brake shutter in the future Quick little tip when you're fitting your discs up, just throw a single wheel nut on it, stops the disc flopping around. Uh, in this particular style of setup, there's no retaining screws that actually hold the disc to the hub. The wheel actually does the job of clamping the disc to the hub. So when you try and put the caliper on, it can be floating around and being annoying. So yeah, just whiz one wheel nut on. You can literally do it by hand. Like that's plenty of tension on there and it, it's held it in place so we can just put the caliper on nicely and be on our way. Stickers! In before, don't get brake cleaner on your hands, comments. Now oh, look, high temp brake lubricant. We're gonna use that. There's your noise. Is that a rock? Yep. See, it's really shiny on that face. Oh, yeah. It's been running on the disc. Oh, a sticker. When you go to test fit your rear disc, obviously on a car that's got a handbrake inside the disc, it's almost like a, con a conventional drum brake setup attached to your disc. So give it a quick test fit. You can feel there that there's no contact at all with the uh, handbrake shoes and the disc. So I'm gonna take it off and adjust the handbrake, which is very similar to adjusting a conventional style drum brake. Or, well, at least on a lot of the Nissans and stuff anyway. Basically just gotta wind out the base adjuster. We've also backed the handbrake cable off inside the car. So you basically do your, your base adjustment here first and you adjust the cable once you're done. So I wound out a couple of turns, we'll give it another test fit. Yeah, so already you can see the shoes have come out too far. So it's nice and easy to just back it off. Now you can do it with the disc on there, but it's quite fiddly because you've only got a really small grommet on these discs. So it's heaps easier to just do it with it off. It can be a little bit slower as far as physical time but it's a lot simpler to do it and you can also uh, see a lot easier which way the thread turns on the adjuster sometimes they're left hand thread sometimes they're right hand thread so you can catch yourself out if you put the disc on and then basically wind the wind the shoes all the way out so we've got the shoes just touching the disc now which is pretty much where we want it so we're going to uh, continue along the fit up We'll put the caliper on. We've actually removed the pads out of the caliper on this side first. This way, it, it seemed a little bit easier to uh, pull it apart. The old discs were really badly lipped and we're changing the pads anyway. So it was nice and easy to pull the pads out before we took the caliper off. And we've also compressed the pistons while we were there. So we'll uh, bolt the caliper back on and then we'll refit all the other good stuff.
taking. We've got all the brakes done, we've got the wheels on. We haven't tensioned the wheels yet, so when, we go, when it goes back on the ground, we're gonna uh, final tension the wheels because they're all lock nuts. I don't wanna go hanging off the, hanging off the sleeve with a gun. So we'll, uh, we'll bar check those, but now we're gonna jump on and do the cooling system flush. The one thing I did do before we drain the coolant is to pressure test it, and I've already found a little leak on the top radiator hose. So once we drop the coolant out of it, we're gonna reseal that uh, top hose and replace the hose clamp. So they're quite a broad clamp, and on some rubber hoses, they don't quite get enough bite on the hose to seal it properly. So we're gonna swap them out for some narrower clamps. But first we're gonna drain all the coolant. Into the volcano. We've got the original hose clamp obviously in my left hand, the new hose clamp in the right. If you have a look at them side by side, the new one is a lot narrower and added bonus is it's not actually cut. They haven't cut the drive slots into the hose clamp, so this one won't actually bite into the hose or cut the hose, whereas these ones can, so we're gonna move to that. And obviously the reason that we've gone for the narrow one is it actually bites into the hose a little bit better as far as sealing. And I don't mean bite in as in cut the hose, obviously, but it has a better uh, clamping area. Because it's wider, it actually spreads the load over a wider area, so sometimes you can get leaks with these uh, wider clamps. So yeah, we've gone for the narrow ones, and super simple, we just drop the hose off one side and we'll slip them both on, and it should be good to go. Missed the bin again. We've got all of the coolant out of our cooling system, so what we're gonna do now is just run a couple of litres of water through it before we actually go to fill our new coolant into it. So we've already put two litres in, we'll put another two in now. And it should start to come out the bottom of the radiator pretty clean. Obviously, we're still just letting it run into the same collection bucket. I think ET's trapped in there somewhere. He's not happy. That's a few more things ticked off the list for the old 180. We've got the discs on, got some new rear pads in it, and we've done a full coolant flush. We've also found a coolant leak, which we've fixed. So all that's left to do is take it for a run and bed the brakes in. Uh, we're not gonna run through the bedding in process because it does vary between manufacturers of discs and pads. So I'd recommend looking at the products you purchase. There should be recommendations from the manufacturer on how to bed either discs or pads in. Um, yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna do it as per recommendation of the particular products we've purchased. But yeah, check with your manufacturer as to how to do those procedures, because it does vary between brands and countries and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, just check the documentation that comes with your products and you'll be sweet. Thanks for watching guys, and we'll see you next time.